Hey kiddos, welcome back for story time. Still reading Fart Powder. Let's see what happens next. Chapter 10. Nilly gets tricked and Juliet Margarine. Margarine? Who knows? <clears throat> the next day, rumors started flying on the playground about a powder that makes you fart louder than you ever have before. And you didn't even have to try hard. And best of all, there was absolutely no smell. Supposedly, the bang was louder than 13 firecrackers, three cherry bombs, and a half stick of dynamite put together, and cost less than a bottle of soda pop. Plus, it was totally harmless and was totally legal. In short, the kids at school thought it was too good to be true. But none of them knew where they could get a hold of this powder. They only knew that Lisa, Nilly, that new little fourth grader with the red hair, knew everything they didn't know. And Lisa and Nilly wouldn't say anything. The other kids nagged them between class, but Lisa just smiled slyly while Nilly said things like, I wonder what the weather's gonna be like tomorrow, or I hear it's gonna be spaghetti and meatballs for lunch in the cafeteria today. During recess, Trolls and Trim came over to Nilly and Lisa, who were standing by the drinking fountain. Well, pipsqueaks, Troll said, towering over them. What's all this we're hearing about some new powder? Spit it out. Nilly raised his head and peered up at them, shielding his eyes. I do believe I can just make out two specimens of Idiot's Colossus. Interesting. <clears throat> what did you call us? Trolls asked, moving a step closer. Lisa automatically stepped back. But Nilly didn't budge. Idiotus Colossus, he said, smiling. A dinosaur that lived in the 17th century. Very strong and very big. I wouldn't be insulted if I were you. Oh, Troll said, squeezing one eye shut, one eye shut so that he looked like a one-eyed troll. How strong, huh? Unbelievably strong, Nilly said. Adiotis Colossus had so many tons of muscles that it was known to have the smallest brain in history in proportion to its body weight. Hey! Trim yelled at Trolls. That dwarf said, just said small brain! Hey! Trolls yelled at Nilly, grabbing hold of his shirt collar. You said small brain! Nilly sighed. You guys need to listen more carefully. Idiotus Colossus actually had a brain that's three times the size of your two brains combined. But that's still a small brain in proportion to 80 tons of muscles. Get it? It's simple math. Trolls and Trim looked at each other uncertainly. Enough brain talk, Troll said, letting go of Nilly's collar. Where's the powder, Mr. Tiny Pants? Nilly looked around cautiously. Okay, he whispered. Since we're practically neighbors, you guys can find out what no one else knows. Trolls and Trim moved in closer to hear what Nilly said. Tomorrow, here by the drinking fountain, Nilly whispered, Lisa and I are going to tell all the kids at school everything you guys need to know. But only you guys know this, okay? Don't tell anyone. Cross my heart, Trim said. Trolls looked at Nilly as if there was something he didn't really like, but couldn't quite put his finger on it. And luckily, before he managed to, the bell rang. That afternoon, Lisa, Nilly, and Dr. Proctor planned and prepared until sundown. They made a sign to put on the gate so that everyone could find the sale, set up a table with a cash box and change, and got the fart powder ready. They filled little plastic bags with one tablespoon of powder from the mason jar of Dr. Proctor's totally normal fart powder and decided to, tell the, to sell them for 50 cents apiece. Although Lisa and Nilly had said that Dr. Proctor should keep the money, the doctor had insisted that they should split whatever they earned three ways. <laughs> Make sure you don't take it from the wrong mason jar and put the fart not powder into the bags instead. Dr. Proctor chuckled. No way, Nilly said, who was responsible for putting one tablespoon or one teaspoon of the special fart 
special formula Fardenot powder into three different envelopes that just needed stamps, since Lisa had already written on them. To NASA, United States of America, keep out of reach of children. Above the big Above the big pear tree, they could see the swallows doing acrobatic dives and swoops to pick up insects for their supper before it got dark. What are you guys gonna do with your share of the money? Lisa asked. I'm gonna buy myself a uniform so I can play in the school band, Nellie said. Oh, I'm going to drive my motorcycle to Paris with the sidecar, Dr. Proctor said. What about you, Lisa? I'm going to buy an airplane ticket to Sarpsburg and visit Anna, she said. If we get that much, I mean. Dr. Proctor laughed. If not, you can have my third. There's no hurry for my trip to Paris. My third, too, Nellie said. I'm sure my mom can sew a new band uniform for me. Thanks, Lisa said, feeling so happy that her cheeks turned red. Not just because she realized that now she, were, she was sure to get enough money to visit Anna, but because she realized that Dr. Proctor and Nellie were so nice to her because they liked her. Lisa liked being liked. Most people do. But she noticed that she especially liked being liked by Nellie and Dr. Proctor. What are you gonna do in Paris, doctor? Nellie asked as he carefully poured powder into one of the bags and then taped it shut. Oh, it's a long story, the doctor said, a distant look coming over his eyes. A long, long story. Does it have anything to do with that picture that's hanging in the cellar? Lisa asked. The one with you and the girl on the motorcycle in front of the Eiffel Tower? That's right, Lisa, Proctor said. Well, let's hear it, Lisa encouraged him. Oh, there's not much to tell, Proctor said. I had a girlfriend there. Her name was Juliet. We were going to get married. Tell us, Lisa whispered eagerly. Tell us, Dr. Proctor. It's just a boring old story, I'm afraid, Dr. Proctor said. But Lisa didn't back down. And in the end, Dr. Proctor gave in. And this is how he told it. When I was studying chemistry in Paris many, many years ago, I met Juliette Marjorie. She was studying chemistry too. And when we saw each other the first time, there was a, a bang. She was a brown eyed beauty and I was, well, I was younger than I am now anyway. And I must have had a certain charm, I guess, because Juliet and I started dating after just a short time. We were inseparable, like two oppositely charged particles in an atom. Huh? Lisa asked. Sorry. Like a magnet and a refrigerator door, the professor explained. Oh, right, Lisa said. Juliet and I were determined to get married when we finished school, but there was one problem. Juliet's father, the Duke of Margarine, was a rich and powerful man who was on the board of regents for the university, and he had totally different plans for Juliet than her marrying a penniless Norwegian without a drop of blue blood in his veins. The day Juliet went to tell her dad that he couldn't stop her from marrying me, she never came back. When I called, they told me that Juliet was sick and couldn't talk to anyone, and especially not me. The next day, I got a letter from the board of the university saying that I'd been expelled from the university because of an experiment that went just a little bit wrong. Well, it's not like it was any big deal or anything. Just a nitroglycerin mis mixture that I happened to shake a little too hard so it exploded and, well, caused a bit of damage. But that kind of thing happened all the time and it had been months since it had happened. So I was very surprised. That night a phone call woke me up. It was Juliet. She whispered that she loved me and that she would wait for me. Then she hung up in a hurry. It wasn't until a few days later when the police came to get me that I understood who was behind the whole thing. They gave me a letter that I couldn't stay in France anymore since I wasn't going to school and didn't have a job. And they drove me to the airport, put me on a first flight back to Norway and said I couldn't come back until I was rich, noble or famous. Since I'm not especially good with money, don't have any aristocratic blood in my veins. I decided to become a famous inventor. 
which isn't that easy because so many things have been invented already, but I've been working day and night trying to invent something that is totally and completely new so that I can go back and find my Juliet. Oh, Lisa said when Dr. Proctor was done telling the story. How romantic. You know what? Millie asked. Dr. Proctor's Fartanat powder will make you world famous, that's for sure. Well, we'll say about that, the doctor said. They heard a grasshopper rubbing its legs together. It was the first one they'd heard that year, and it made them realize that summer wasn't far off. Then they glanced up at the moon, which hung pale and almost transparent over the pear tree. All right, guys. Chapter 10 down. So far we have read 112 pages of this book. Super fun. Um, hope you guys are having fun, staying safe. Um, let me know if you have any predictions about Dr. Proctor and Juliet and maybe Anna and Sarpsburg or that weird snake thing that's in the drains who knows let me know have a great day i'll talk to you tomorrow bye